Hello, everyone, and welcome to this briefing on invoking Section 502B of the Foreign Assistance Act and Israel, hosted by the Friends Committee on National Legislation, Demand Progress, and Civic. My name is Odelia Matter, and I'm the Program Assistant on Middle East Policy at FCNL, and I will be moderating the briefing today. It has been over three months since Hamas's brutal attack in Israel killed more than 1,200 people and over 200 were taken hostage. Since then, Israel's airstrikes, ground incursion, and blockade in Gaza have killed over 23,000 Palestinians, more than 1% of the entire population of Gaza. We are also witnessing a severe humanitarian crisis in Gaza, wherein according to the United Nations Global Food Insecurity Assessment, Gaza could reach the level of famine as early as February. Over 130 hostages remain in Gaza, while the Israeli military has ultimately killed more hostages than it managed to rescue via military efforts. In addressing these devastating figures and the regional implications of this war, concerns have been raised amongst experts and on the Hill about Israel's military strategy and the role that U.S. weapons are playing in civilian harm in Gaza. On December 15th, Senator Bernie Sanders introduced SRES 504, invoking Section 502BC of the Foreign Assistance Act, a rarely used oversight mechanism focusing on U.S. arms sales and human rights. Today, this vote will come to the Senate floor. So I will note that this briefing will be recorded, but will be sh shut off for the Q&A portion. And our speakers today are uh, Josh Paul, Elizabeth Regebe, and John Ramming Chapel. First, we'll hear from Josh Paul, who recently resigned from the State Department after over 11 years working as a director in the Bureau of Political Military Affairs, which is responsible for U.S. defense diplomacy, security assistance, and arms transfers. He previously worked on the security sector reform in both Iraq and the West Bank, and also worked on the Hill for Representative Steve Israel. Josh, could you tell us a bit about the Biden administration's general approach to Israel's operations in Gaza thus far, and how SRES 504 fits into what the U.S. government is already doing? Yes, thank you, uh, and good morning to everyone. Uh, it's good to see uh, some familiar names from my old life uh, attending this discussion, uh, so I look forward to uh, your questions. Um, so President Biden's position uh, and the administration's position on the conflict has really not changed significantly since day one. Uh, the U.S. government, the administration remains committed to Israel's military operation uh, to President Prime Minister Netanyahu's uh, military operation in Gaza. Uh, and that continues to provide and enable it with unconditioned military support uh, as much and as fast as is needed, as many of you will be aware. Uh, there has been, to be fair, some pushing behind the scenes. Uh, early on, uh, the Biden administration got Israel to delay and to some extent to scale down uh, the ground operation, uh, although I think we can question uh, how how wise that will actually was in the longer term. Um, and the Biden administration is continuing, to be fair, to push for more precise operations that lead to fewer civilian casualties. Uh, but that doesn't mean a significant change in policy. It does mean a change in tone, uh, but there has not been a change in policy. And I think that's unfortunate. We see that the Biden administration is pushing Israel, for example, to end its ground operation uh, by the end of January, at least this, this phase of the ground operation. Uh, it's not clear if Israel is going to get there. Uh, and I think that is leading to some significant and mounting tensions between this administration and its Israeli counterparts. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I'm just dropping in the chat there a link to an Axios article uh, from uh, a few days ago describing some of those tensions. And I think in that context, um, you know, I, I'm not going to say that the Biden administration would in any way welcome this resolution, but it does actually make it a bit easier for them uh, in the sense that it adds pressure without actually changing uh, anything in this significant policy in the short term. Uh, so I would note that. <clears throat> so let's let's talk about this resolution from Senator Sanders, which requests several types of information in a report from the administration. Uh, what kind of information does the U.S. government actually collect in circumstances like this? Um, the resolution seeks several broad areas of information. Those include human rights violations by Israel, uh, steps taken by the U.S. government in response to those uh, as such, uh, then a certification uh, that no unit has been receiving U that is receiving U.S. arms has committed a gross violation of human rights, and finally a summary of equipment provided to Israel 
uh, and whether essentially end use monitoring protocols are being followed. Uh, I do want to say at the top that if uh, a senator, for example, uh, does not believe that Israel has committed any human rights violations of the types described in this resolution, uh, then they should have no problem with supporting this resolution, uh, because, of course, that is what the department will report. Um, so, so I just wanted to lay that out there for what it's worth. Um, so let's talk about those areas of request. So to the extent that such violations may occur, uh, you can assume that the US government does collect information on those uh, and does so really in four main ways. The first is through the Israel Leahy Vetting Forum, uh, which, as many of you know, works unlike the way we do human rights vetting for almost everyone else in the world. And we can talk more about those processes in detail if you like. Um, but that the Israel Leahy Vetting Forum collects information uh, mainly from open sources, uh, such as NGOs, and it then assesses those for credibility. So it's not that every report of a potential violation uh, would get assessed within the Israel Leahy Vetting Forum, uh, it's just those that the forum believes are likely to be credible. Uh, the second, and this is a new one, uh, is the Civilian Harm Implementation Response Guidelines. Uh, again, as many of you will be aware, there was an old act that went out, uh, an, a cable to all uh, embassies and posts, um, back in August that created this process. Uh, and this process is intended to collect information about incidents of civilian harm resulting from US origin weaponry. Uh, that process has, I understand, started to collect information probably since early to mid-November timeframe is when it began to, to actually look at this uh, situation in Gaza. Um, so that will be another source. A third source, of course, is intelligence community reporting. Uh, and here we can talk about the report referenced by CNN uh, that in December uh, that assessed that over 50% of bombs dropped by Israel in Gaza were not precision guided, i.e. were dumb bombs. Uh, and then, of course, the fourth source of information the State Department will certainly have is diplomatic reporting. Uh, cables, particularly from Embassy Jerusalem, uh, but also from others in the region, uh, reading out conversations with the government of Israel uh, and, of course, with civil society, including on the Palestinian side. Um, so was this resolution to go forward, uh, I think there is a body of information there that the department could draw on in responding. Um, in terms of steps that have been taken by the US government, uh, so first of all, let me talk about this in terms of what I know from my own experience. Uh, that would be in relation to the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen, uh, where there were similar concerns raised about humanitarian harm, about civilian casualties. Uh, in that context, the US government conducted military expert analysis uh, it conducted outreach uh, to the Saudi-led coalition from the command levels uh, all the way down to the unit levels to assess causes of civilian harm uh, and to identify steps for mitigation. Uh, we provided enhanced training on the law of armed conflict and civilian harm mitigation, uh, including in terms of tactical training, and built a package, uh, essentially strengthening everything from legal oversight within the Saudi-led coalition processes uh, inside the, uh, the talks, inside the operation centers, uh, two things like weapons mensuration, working with the uh, coalition on what weapons suit what targets, uh, and of course conducted diplomatic outreach, uh, and ultimately under President Biden suspended certain arms transfers. Um, so those are the sorts of steps the US government may be taking. Uh, I, I don't know that they are, but certainly are available to the US in this context. Uh, second, uh, in terms of open source reporting regarding Israel, uh, the US government has again reportedly engaged to delay uh, and, and to scope down uh, ground operations. Uh, it has pressed publicly, as well as behind closed doors, to minimize civilian casualties. Uh, so there are steps as well, again, that can be reported on that the US has taken uh, in response to any reporting it may have received. Um, there is also the potential, of course, that we have provided intelligence support, uh, not only as has been publicly acknowledged uh, in looking for hostages, uh, but also on targeting uh, the intercept reported recently. I think that does raise the question, and there is always a balance to be struck, I think, uh, between whether that makes Israel more precise or us more complicit. Um, but uh, so, but that is that is certainly something out there. Um, and then, of course, the report also asks for steps uh, that the US has taken to disassociate itself uh, from any violations, as indeed is required under the Foreign Assistance Act. Uh, there, I am afraid I'm not sure uh, you will find much, uh, but it's certainly worth asking. Uh, on the certification requirement, uh, so the uh, I've discussed this publicly before and happy to go into this. Uh, the Israel Leahy Vetting Forum um, certainly has not formally uh, designated any unit 
uh, as being ineligible for US security assistance under the Leahy law. Uh, that does not mean uh, it has not found any unit to have ever engaged in a GBHR, including since 2018. Uh, of course, there is a requirement under Leahy or a permission under Leahy that we may defer to the military justice system of a country if they are taking action. Uh, I think we can raise valid questions about the legitimacy in some cases of the Israeli military justice system when it comes to holding its own forces accountable. Um, but I think a reporting requirement here uh, within the resolution uh, would turn up some material from the Israel Leahy vetting forum. Uh, it might also turn up, uh, as it requires, uh, an official description of the processes used to come to those determinations. And I think that would be helpful. There is a, uh, a memorandum of understanding that exists that lays out the ILDF framework. Um, and I think it would be useful to you in assessing uh, the department's report to understand the framework that it uses for vetting of Israeli forces. Uh, and you'll probably get something along those lines. Uh, two more things. Uh, the resolution also calls for a summary and a list of weapons and munitions provided to Israel. Uh, I understand many offices and committees have been pressing for this. Those of you on Senate Foreign Relations Committee staff may have seen the list the administration is providing uh, on a regular basis at a classified level. Uh, that's, of course, unlike the uh, biweekly list that we provided, or I say we, that the administration provides on Ukraine, which is provided at an SBU level. Um, and my understanding as well is that the list that some of you may have access to that is classified is not a complete list. Uh, it includes uh, FMS authorizations, DCS authorizations, uh, FMS deliveries to some extent, uh, but it does not include, of course, DCS deliveries, and nor does it include, to the best of my understanding, uh, transfers from Warsaw, for which the accounting is done on the back end, uh, and CENTCOM, I think, is scrambling to keep up with. Um, and it also, of course, does not include any transfers under authorities other than state or DODs, uh, and I think that is something you will want to know about as well. Uh, finally, uh, the report asks on compliance with end-use monitoring. Uh, some of you, many of you perhaps will be familiar uh, that end-use monitoring is, is not what it says on the label, right? We don't monitor end-use. Uh, what we do do uh, is monitor to ensure that weapons have not been illicitly retransferred, uh, reverse engineered or re-engineered. Uh, I think there is a question as to, to the extent to which we're doing that, particularly on the direct commercial sales side. Uh, and I would encourage you to think about the Blue Lantern program, which applies to end-use monitoring there, uh, and whether we are doing post-shipment checks, for example, uh, on firearms, including previous shipments of firearms that have been sent to Israeli forces and Israeli security forces to ensure that they are not being provided to settler militias in the West Bank, which I know many of your bosses have raised in private with the administration. So I think there is a, a good sort of quest set of questions uh, when it comes to end-use monitoring in that space. Uh, although not when it comes to the application of end-use monitoring uh, towards actual end-use. Um, so I will leave it there for now. And uh, yeah, back to you. Thank you so much, Josh. That's very valuable. And considering some of the things that you've just shared, how do you think this resolution could have actually affect decision-making and the policy process within the State Department? Yeah. Uh, so obviously, if it were to pass, it, it will make a significant difference and, and drive an important reporting process. I think even if it does not pass, uh, I think there is still a lot of, it makes a difference. Um, State Department does consider, I will tell you based on my own experience, uh, how many people, how many senators sign on to a letter or a bill or support a bill or resolution uh, as we discuss, as it discusses internally, how seriously to take the concerns being raised by Congress and whether they need to be addressed, notwithstanding uh, the passage of a resolution. Uh, it also increases the willingness in many cases of the State Department to engage with those members who are raising those issues uh, rather than sort of deterring them from doing so. Um, second, it gives a hook to internal conversations, right? So you have a lot of people right now who are working within the State Department who are trying to raise some of these concerns. Uh, and for them, being able to point to a well-supported resolution uh, encourages them to continue to collect data uh, and to enhance and expand their efforts in case this comes back again so that they have uh, are ready for that. Uh, third, um, so I think regardless, again, of whether it passes, for every member that votes for this, this is something that the department is going to have to think about in its engagement with those members. And it will go through the process of drafting responses to what we call if asks uh, or if raised questions. Uh, and th those will be folded into the materials for the senators who have supported this so that if a senator says, well, I know this resolution didn't pass, 
But what are you doing about, you know, responding to potential human rights violations? Or what are you doing on humanitarian assistance, uh, for example? Uh, those questions will have been drafted for principals who are engaging with your senators. Um, and then finally, uh, this, of course, will also, within the department, generate material uh, that uh, in the longer term, OIG, GAO uh, will certainly be reviewing uh, as they go through their own processes, which I know they are. Uh, in the coming weeks and months. So I, I think, you know, any, any significant support, I think, is helpful uh, to the internal debarment processes. Over. Much appreciated, Josh, especially uh, considering your experience and work from within the administration. So thank you. Um, next, we'll hear from Elizabeth Rugebi, MENA Advocacy Director for Amnesty International USA. Prior to this, she served as the Levant researcher with the Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies based in Tunis. Elizabeth has conducted human rights advocacy on the MENA region at the United Nations, European Union, and before national governments in close collaboration with local civil society organizations across the Middle East and North Africa. So Elizabeth, um, Amnesty International has been documenting civilian harm and possible international law violations in Israel's operations in Gaza. Can you speak about some of your findings regarding the use of US weapons in civilian harm incidents in Gaza? and how your, your uh, documentation relates to SRES 504. Thank you, Odelia. Um, so Amnesty International has been conducting independent investigations into violations of international humanitarian and human rights law by all parties within Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories for decades. Um, with respect to our research, our teams conduct field and remote research, collecting multiple firsthand testimonies and other evidence of violations. This also includes digital investigations of specific incidents, verifying and analyzing photographic and video material of potential violations, as well as remote sensing data such as satellite imagery. Uh, we also have a team of weapons experts who analyze and review material related to the type of weaponry used in particular attacks. Uh, and our teams work closely with field workers based in Gaza that support our documentation efforts. So with respect to some of our um, findings since October 7th, um, I'm gonna focus on uh, the situation in Gaza here and, and some of our uh, more recent um, publications. So with respect to Gaza, um, Palestinians in Gaza have endured a staggering scale of death and destruction with more than 24,000 Palestinians killed in just over three months and a further 10,000 missing under the rubble presumed, uh, presumed to be dead. It is within this context that Amnesty has issued findings on several Israeli airstrikes um, with investigations ongoing in two dozens more. On December 5th, Amnesty issued its findings from a new investigation into two unlawful and deadly airstrikes on homes full of civilians in Gaza. Um, in these two cases, our researchers found fragments of US-made joint direct attack munitions, otherwise known as JDAMs, in the rubble of the two destroyed homes. Photos of the metal fragments from the weapons clearly show the stamped codes associated with JDAMs and Boeing, the manufacturer in this instance. In these two attacks, 43 civilians were killed from the al najjar and al muayda families, uh, including 19 children, 14 women, and 10 men. In both cases, the survivors said that they'd been given no warning of an imminent strike uh, in advance, and Amnesty did not find any indication that there were military objectives uh, in the area or that the people in the homes were legitimate military targets. As evidenced by these two instances, U.S.-made weapons have facilitated the killing of extended Palestinian families, and Amnesty is calling for these attacks to be investigated as war crimes. The fact that U.S.-made munitions are being used by the Israeli military in unlawful attacks on civilians should be a wake-up call. This report by Amnesty um, from December 5th also builds on prior findings regarding several other Israeli airstrikes since October 5th, uh, 7th that were found to be unlawful and indiscriminate, which have caused mass civilian casualties and that we have also called to be, for to be investigated as war crimes. Um, among these several attacks, these have included strikes on homes, residential buildings, a refugee camp, a church, and a public market. Similarly, in these cases, Amnesty International did not find indications that there were any military objectives or targets at the sites. Um, however, in these cases that I'm mentioning within this section, um, Amnesty was not able to identify the um, exact type or origin of, of the munitions used. 
So with respect to Amnesty's findings over the last uh, three months or so, um, we have found that the ongoing Israeli airstrikes form part of a longstanding pattern of reckless air, reckless attacks by Israeli forces that strike civilian objects, um, and that this is also consistent with uh, patterns that Amnesty had documented in pri prior conflicts, including uh, 2008, 2009, 2014, and 2021, uh, with respect to uh, Israeli military offenses, uh, offensives in Gaza. Um, and so just to underscore with the scale of destruction that we've been seeing, um, the, the pattern of indiscriminate attacks against civilians and civilian objects, I would just underscore that there is nowhere safe to go for Gazans, uh, for Gaza's more than 2 million population. Uh, in closing, these facts underscore the urgent need for senators to exercise congressional oversight and vote in favor of SRES 504 this afternoon. It is critically important that the U.S. is conducting the necessary assessments into any and all violations of human rights by the Israeli authorities. And having a report mandated uh, from the State Department would be an important step in doing so. The United States has a responsibility to ensure weapons and other military support it provides to any foreign government including the Israeli government, are not used in violation of U.S. or international law. Thank you. Elizabeth, thank you so much. Um, and I'd also like to ask if, um, if there are other types of violations that Amnesty International is tracking at the moment. Sure. Um, so Amnesty has uh, been tracking a, a number of violations um, by all parties throughout this, uh, this period. Um, but what I'll focus on here in my response will be uh, some of the gross violations of human rights that we've been tracking, um, primarily the denial of humanitarian needs, as well as the spike that we've been seeing um, in the use of arbitrary detention in the West Bank, as well as incidents of enforced disappearances in Gaza. And then with respect to both cases, the use of torture and other ill treatment against civilians. Um, so with respect to the hum humanitarian situation, Due to the ongoing 16-year unlawful air, land, and sea blockade, the Gaza Strip has long been in a perpetual human-made human humanitarian crisis. As a result, the blockade had de debilitated Gaza's health system and economy, while also having a heavy toll on essential infrastructure. This brings us to October 9th, when the Israeli Minister of Defense ordered a complete siege on Gaza, uh, which included the cutting off of the supply of food, water, fuel, and electricity, to its more than 2 million population. In the three months since, this policy has plunged Gaza into a humanitarian catastrophe by inflicting unfathomable levels of suffering and putting the very survival of civilians in Gaza at risk. The UN has reiterated warnings of the risk of famine in Gaza, which would further compound the humanitarian catastrophe as sick people are more likely to succumb to starvation and starving people are more vulnerable to disease. To disease. Moreover, the World Health Organization has warned that the conflict has damaged or destroyed essential water, sanitation, health infrastructure, limiting the capacity to treat severe malnutrition and infectious disease outbreaks. Uh, aid agencies and humanitarian organizations have also continued to reiterate that the amount of aid being allowed in through the Rafah and Kerem Shalom crossings is insufficient given the scale of the need um, at, at the currently. Uh, and moreover, that their staff are working in extremely difficult and dangerous conditions that make it very difficult to access all areas of Gaza where relief is, is urgently needed. So with respect to amnesty, um, we've concluded that this constitutes deliberate denial of humanitarian aid and the destruction of the basis for living in Gaza. Um, and I would just reiterate here that collective punishment of a civilian population is a war crime, as is using starvation of civilians as a weapon of war. Secondly, Amnesty has also been monitoring, uh, as I mentioned, the spike in arbitrary detention and enforced disappearance of Palestinians. Um, since October 7th, Israeli authorities have dramatically increased their use of administrative detention across the occupied West Bank. Now, administrative detention is a form of arbitrary detention, meaning detention without charge or trial that can be renewed indefinitely. Um, and its use was already at a 20-year high prior to October 7th. According to Hamoked, an Israeli NGO, as of January 2024, Israel currently holds uh, 3,291 uh, administrative detainees in the West Bank. 
<clears throat> this period has also included the imposition of extended emergency measures that facilitate inhuman and degrading treatment of Palestinian prisoners. The Israeli authorities have also failed to investigate incidents of torture and death in custody. Uh, Amnesty has documented testimony from released detainees and human rights lawyers, as well as video footage and images uh, that have illustrated some of the forms of torture and other ill treatment prisoners have been subjected to. Uh, and this has included severe beatings and deliberate humiliation while Palestinians are detained in dire conditions. Uh, videos and images have been shared widely showing Israeli forces blindfolding detainees, stripping, of them, stripping them of their clothes, um, tying their hands in what has been a chilling display of torture and humiliation. With respect to Gaza, Amnesty remains deeply concerned about the fate and whereabouts of Palestinians from Gaza that have been detained by Israeli, Israeli forces amid reports of mass and forced disappearances. Amnesty's Crisis Evidence Lab has verified photos and video footage showing Israeli forces inhuman and degrading treatment of detain is, detainees in Beit Lahia in northern Gaza, whose fates and whereabouts remain unknown. Uh, other Palestinians from Gaza, including workers or others with permits to enter Israel, uh, have also remained forcibly disappeared, while Israeli authorities have confirmed uh, the deaths in custody of at least six Palestinians, including two workers from Gaza in October and November. Uh, there's been no transparency from Israeli authorities about how many are still detained. Um, and I just I wanted to close by pointing out two specific cases that we've been following uh, of two journalists from Gaza. Nidal al wahedi and Haytham al abdul uh, who were detained by Israeli forces on October 7th while reporting on the Hamas-led attacks in southern Israel. Uh, since then, the Israeli authorities have refused to disclose their whereabouts or the legal grounds for their arrest, which amounts to enforced disappearance. Um, and just to, to wrap it up, torture, inhuman treatment, enforced disappearances, and outrages upon personal dignity committed in situations of armed conflict and occupation are war crimes. And when they are committed as part of a systematic or widespread attack against civilians, they amount to crimes against humanity. Thank you. Elizabeth, again, thank you so much. Um, this is extremely crucial information to keep in mind when addressing the U.S. involvement in the war in Gaza. Um, next, we'll hear from John Raming Chapel, who is an advocacy and legal fellow at Center for Civilians in Conflict, or CIVIC. His work focuses on U.S. law and policy related to civilian harm, arms sales and security assistance. He's published numerous articles on US arms sales law and policy and is a leading authority on section 502B of the Foreign Assistance Act. Um, so John, what is the significance of using section 502B in this way? And what does the 502B process look like now that Senator Sanders has introduced SRES 504? Thank you so much, Adelia. Um, thanks also to Josh and Elizabeth for really valuable remarks to start us off. Um, so to start off on the importance of using 502B, Section 502B of the Foreign Assistance Act complements some of the other oversight tools that y'all might already be familiar with. Um, Josh earlier talked a little, little bit about the Leahy Law. You also might be familiar with the Arms Export Control Act and its joint resolutions of disapproval. And I wanted to quickly address why this resolution uh, and Section 502B more generally gets at issues that aren't covered by other mechanisms. Um, so to start off with the Arms Export Control Act, when there is a notified sale uh, that, that exceeds a certain value threshold, uh, Congress has 15 days to pass a joint resolution of disapproval that theoretically could block that sale. That's never happened um, for reasons that... Uh, basically boil down to a 1980s Supreme Court decision that means that in practice, um, a supermajority in both chambers is needed to pass such a resolution. 15 days is also a very short period, and that's the review period when it comes to uh, major arms sales to Israel. And there have been very few, in the grand scheme of things, notified sales when it comes to uh, Israel, uh, because likely um, there are many transfers that are occurring below the value threshold. And so we've only seen uh, a couple uh, that exceed that threshold. And those uh, used emergency authorities to get around congressional review. Uh, and that's something we haven't seen in this way uh, in such quick succession with a country that has civilian harm uh, concerns, 
since the Trump administration's use of this emergency authority for transfers to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Um, so the Arms Export Control Act doesn't fill this niche. The Leahy Law, uh, while it's a very important uh, mechanism, um, and Josh talked a little bit about it already, but one important thing to emphasize about it is that it's unit specific. Um, and so the Leahy Law uh, prohibits uh, U.S. assistance to any um, unit of foreign security forces where the U.S. government has credible information of a gross violation of human rights. And so that operates at a very different scale uh, from Section uh, 502B, which gives this flexible tool uh, to request information on a whole host of uh, possible uh, violations and patterns of conduct at a different scales. Um, so it's important to also uh, um, visit like what this resolution actually does. Um, and it's part of a broader process uh, that is laid out in Section 5 of the Foreign Assistance Act. And so it's important to be clear about what this specific vote is about. And the specific vote is about whether the Senate uh, wants more information from the State Department regarding uh, Israel's human rights practices. That is what the vote is about. And so it would require a report. If it passed, then it would give uh, Congress potentially additional oversight options, but those would require different actions and new votes. Um, and so, for example, uh, after the receipt of, the, of a report, uh, Congress could um, enact a joint resolution disapproval um, to uh, modify some aspects of U.S. security assistance to Israel. But again, that would be a different process. And in fact, historically, what we've seen is that um, the last time that reports such as these were provided, uh, oversight occurred through other mechanisms, through must-pass legislation like the Appropriations Acts. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about more that. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, but I also want to be sure to run through some of the basic procedure, which is that we're looking at a single chamber resolution. Um, and so this is a vote currently solely in the Senate, um, which is also where the privilege applies, which is uh, how this is getting a vote relatively quickly. Um, and uh, because it's a single chamber resolution, it won't go to the House, and it also um, will not uh, go to the president for signature or veto, um, which creates different opportunities than come would come up through uh, other um, more standard um, legislative vehicles. Um, and so the other thing that I wanted to bring up is that when Congress uh, passed Section 502B, uh, the Foreign Assistance Act in 1976, it was uh, during the Kissinger era, and they created an enforcement mechanism to ensure that reports would be provided. Um, and indeed, reports were provided when they were requested in 1976. Uh, and so there is a provision that would automatically pause the delivery of uh, security assistance to the target country after 30 days uh, if a report's not provided. Um, it's important to emphasize that that's quite unlikely in this instance, because any report, um, regardless of how responsive, uh, regardless of how members of the Senate um, would receive it, would be sufficient to stave off that automatic pause. Additionally, the automatic pause um, isn't uh, all encompassing. Um, it, it, the technicalities of how security assistance is, assistance is defined in uh, Section 502BD um, is quite important. Uh, and based on some recent uh, research, it appears that even if there was an automatic pause that uh, certain forms of Iron Dome assistance would not be implicated, which is quite interesting and speaks to the unusual structure of US uh, assistance to Israel. Um, But as I mentioned, uh, the automatic pause um, only comes into to play if first the resolution passes, then after 30 days, the State Department has not provided the report, uh, and then upon provision of a report, uh, any uh, further um, assistance could proceed. And so that's quite a narrow set of circumstances, one that I think is we're unlikely to see, partly because uh, the Biden administration um, is likely to uh, respond 
with some sort of report. Um, now, after a report is received, uh, as I mentioned, there is the possibility uh, of further oversight. And that this report is all about giving Congress the tools that it needs to conduct oversight uh, that is specific to the human, human rights and international humanitarian law issues. Um, the last thing uh, when it comes to other oversight mechanisms I want to mention is a supplemental. Um, we have seen promising movement uh, from some members of the Senate to introduce uh, publicly um, their proposed uh, amendments to supplemental. I think that these complement strongly uh, the uh, SRES 504 resolution, and they shouldn't be seen as mutually exclusive. And uh, the vote has been scheduled in such a manner so that it won't interfere uh, with supplemental negotiations. So uh, that is a bit all over the map when it comes to next steps and process and the technicalities. Um, Adelia, uh, over back to you. Thank you so much, John. Um, and I also understand that Section 502B is not a commonly used tool. So can you talk more about past uses of Section 502B as context for SRES 504? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. So you might have heard that this is the first time that there's been a vote on this uh, using this provision of the uh, Foreign Assistance Act, Section 502B. And that is true. Um, there hasn't previously been a vote uh, using this particular mechanism. Uh, but other resolutions have been introduced. Uh, and so, for example, um, with regard to U.S. security assistance uh, to Turkey, Azerbaijan, and Saudi Arabia, we've seen resolutions from Senators Merkley, Menendez, uh, Murphy, Young, and Lee, uh, all since 2018. Um, there was a bit of a decline in the uh, in recognition and familiarity with uh, Section 502B from the 1980s onwards. Part of that was uh, because of a lot of resistance uh, from the Reagan administration to implementing certain parts of Section 502B. Um, but when Section 502B of the Foreign Assistance Act was enacted, it was part of this really important moment on Capitol Hill when human rights oversight uh, was a real focus. And so um, this came after a really significant report, um, Human Rights in the World Community, or Global Community, I believe is the title, uh, that was kind of a landmark um, piece of uh, reporting um, by uh, congressional committees, and it led to the institution of the Country Reports on Human Rights Practices, something that many of you are likely uh, familiar with, the uh, annual um, reporting on human rights that is mandated in Section 502B, and that this mechanism, 502BC, is kind of meant to uh, complement, because on one hand, you have regular reporting, and on the other hand, you have enhanced, more targeted, and, spe and uh, specific requests for information. Um, also, though, uh, from the, the enactment of Section 502B came... Uh, the policy of the United States that human rights and the promotion of human rights was a goal of U.S. foreign policy, which hadn't been in U.S. law previously. Uh, and then also a prohibition on um, the provision of security assistance to any country, the government of which engages in a, in a consistent pattern of gross violations of human rights, um, which was kind of like a precursor uh, to the Leahy Law. Um so, uh, in 1976, using Section 502B, the, uh, I kind of alluded to this earlier, the Congress, uh, through what was then the House International Relations Committee, uh, requested uh, reports pursuant to Section 502BC uh, for uh, Argentina, Haiti, Indonesia, Iran, Peru, and the Philippines, um, and then None of those resulted in joint resolutions of disapproval, which is possible under the process, but rather uh, oversight happened through other ways. And so, for example, the Kennedy-Humphrey Amendment um, for Argentina uh, was uh, a quick follow-up um, to, uh, to the results of the reports. And it was uh, after Senator Humphrey said that the report was uh, about as exciting as a mouthful of sawdust, if I remember correctly. 
Uh, and so this speaks to the options that Congress has under Section 502B. And this is a significant moment, you know, the first time invoking uh, the resolution aspect and the, the vote on a resolution since the enactment of the act in 1976. Um, but we've seen a lot of uh, increased interest um, in this human rights oversight tool since 2018. Uh, so that's what I'll end with for now. Uh, thank you again to the organizers and my co-panelists. I think it's been a great discussion and we've reached the final portion of this briefing. So I'll ask each speaker to provide uh, 60 second closing words in the order of speakers. So let's start with Josh, then John, then Elizabeth. Yeah, thank you. Um, so again, I think this resolution is an important messaging tool uh, that essentially provides the Biden administration with another quiver in its hour, arrow, uh, in its uh, another arrow in its quiver, rather, uh, as it engages with uh, Israel in trying to push them uh, in a better direction. Uh, it doesn't, you know, assuming it doesn't pass, it still provides that effective tool and messaging and says, look, things are going to have to change. Uh, and I think that that's in everyone's interest, uh, including the Biden administration's own interest. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you. I think my message is pretty simple. Um, Amnesty urges senators to please vote yes on SRS 504. It's critically important in this moment, given the unprecedented levels of civilian casualties that we're seeing. Uh, the destruction of civilian infrastructure and the worsening human rights uh, humanitarian situation on the ground. Um, you know, all we're asking for here is a report from the State Department into the situation uh, so that Congress can conduct its oversight role. Um, so yes, we urge, we strongly urge senators to vote yes, and it's a critically important moment. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. John. I think the urgency here can't be overstated. Uh, for tens of thousands of people in Gaza, it's already too late. The reverbing uh, impacts of the widespread use of explosive weapons in one of the most densely populated areas on Earth will be felt for decades. Um, and the United States uh, has contributed to the devastation that we're seeing significantly. Um, as I said, it's already too late for tens of thousands of people um, I think the least that uh, the U.S. Congress could do at this juncture is request a report, get more information, and as quickly as possible move forward with uh, basic human rights oversight. Um, thank you. I could not agree more with the three of you. Um, so thank you again to our speakers, and thank you all so much for coming and attending. Uh, keep an eye out for a follow-up email with a recording of this briefing and further resources. And if you have any follow-up questions, including perhaps means of contacting speakers, you can reach out to Kavon at demandprogress.org. That is Kavon, C-A-V-A-N, at demandprogress.org. Again, thank you so much. Thank you.